Hi, I'm Jan Witkowski here at Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory on the occasion of the 87th Cold Spring Harbour Symposium and the topic uh, this year are uh, stem cells and I have with me Ken Zarat from the University of Pennsylvania who spoke earlier this morning. And, and Ken, your, the primary interest of your lab is, is really in chroma, chromatin dynamics during cell differentiation or other changes in cell state? Yes, our main interest is in how the barrier of chromatin, which is a way of packaging genes so they fit into a nucleus, um, can be overcome. So the DNA in our cells is about two yards wide or two meters wide, gets squished into a nucleus, and the packaging mechanism is called chromatin, and that can impede gene activity. So when you change a cell fate, you need to turn on genes that were packaged in chromatin and how does that happen? And that's what I talked about today. Right. And you're, the, the change you were talking about today, I'm particularly interested in is uh, somatic cell reprogramming, making iPS cells from regular fibroblasts. Right, so we were taking human skin cells and reprogramming them into pluripotent cells using a method developed by Shinya Yamanaka's lab back in 2006 and 2007. Mm -hmm. and we had uh, long assumed that the reason it takes a month is because there are these barriers to chromatin, as I discussed. And uh, we had assumed that the main barrier was somewhere two weeks in because that's when a, a new class of genes gets turned on. So that's where we kind of expected to see changes in chromatin dynamics. And it was also known from work from Tom Mastelli many years ago that uh, the Pluripotent cells, which have the capacity to develop into any tissue or cell in the body, um, have much more dynamic chromatin, meaning it's moving around. If you look at the molecules, you can see the chromosome molecules bouncing around. You mean, you mean literally moving around? Literally moving around. You can tell this by tagging a chromosomal protein called histone H2B with a fluorescent tag and then use complicated microscopy to watch how the molecules move. And you could see that the molecules, the, the chromosomal molecules are moving much more rapidly in pluripotent cells, again, that have the capacity to make all the cells of the body, compared to a differentiated cell like a skin cell or a fibroblast. So we were looking at the conversion using the Yamanaka factors from the fibroblasts into the pluripotent cells and marking the chromosomes with this H2B fused to a very, very sensitive fluorescent mm. dye. So you're using the, the, this, this chromatin tag with the fluorescent dye to track the movements of the, of the chromatin. Exactly. In, and so in the, in the case that you're talking about, you, you treat the, uh, the fibroblasts with the Yamanaka factors and then track, examine how the change in chromatin mobility over time using this fluorescent tag. Yes. So the, the method we're using is so-called Sendai virus, which is an RNA virus that's only transiently turning on the Yamanaka genes. And we're using uh, conditions that are used by our facility at the University of Pennsylvania that makes induced pluripotent stem cells all the time. So it's just conventional methods. And then we, in addition to adding the Yamanaka factors, we, we knock in or we add to the cells this H2B halo fluorescent tag and then use complicated microscopy, and this was done by Jonathan Lerner, a postdoc in my lab, to map how the H2B molecules move around. And so going back to what you said a moment to go about, uh, the, the, the assumption had been that the, there was a, a chromatin barrier that got released at two weeks. You were presumably expecting only at that point to see the change in mobility of the chromatin in the cells being treated. Perfect, exactly. <laughs> we, we, you gave a good talk today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Now we expected, based on the literature and our own work, that uh, the major change in chromatin would happen after a few weeks when late genes that are sort of deterministic genes for developing pluripotent cells finally get turned on. And the big punchline of my talk is that within the first couple days of inducing these Yamanaka factors in fibroblast cells, the chromatin gets very dynamic with the uh, nucleosomes moving around uh, much more loosely, analogous to the way, the, the way they do in pluripotent cells. 
So whatever initial chromatin barrier was there, it gets broken down right away, and then other events happen. Now, we detected a later chromatin barrier event using this technology at the periphery of the nucleus. That domain is refractory to this initial opening, but then around the two-week point, that gets broken down, and uh, off you go. You make pluripotent cells. But not all the cells in a culture become pluripotent pluripotent, I mean, despite right. the fact that they all have this initial opening, right. opening up, it's not 100% efficient conversion. No, in fact, it's very inefficient, so that's a good point. Um, Jing Tao Zhang, another postdoc in my lab, figured out a way to simultaneously label the cells for whether they were on the path to reprogramming using a cell surface marker or markers, um, and then compare that to the movement of the histones inside the nucleus in the same living cell as the cells were continuing on. And yes, only a minority of the cells actually go on to become pluripotent. So this initial blast of chromatin opening doesn't obligate the cell to become pluripotent, but it seems to be a gateway to allow that to happen. And the cells that don't go on to be pluripotent, does their chromatin revert to a compacted state? Absolutely. We saw just within a few days later, between four days and seven days, the cells that do not go on to become pluripotent or are not on the path uh, have a complete reversion of their chromatin loosening, uh, this phenomenon that we observed. Uh, and so the difference between them is that the cells that are um, continuing with this open state towards pluripotency have begun to activate the endogenous networks that allow this to happen. Right. So why, why does that only happen to a small proportion? Uh, is it some sort of sense of stochastic thing that by chance some cells uh, activate the endogenous uh, genes? Or Right. That's sort of the million dollar question uh, in the whole field. I mean, after you know, over 15 years of this IPS technology, what is it that uh, specifically determines which cells will go on? So we've, we've characterized, many labs have characterized uh, all kinds of details about where the transcription factors bind and how the somatic program gets decommissioned and things like that. But um, the exact formula or mechanism by which a few cells get selected to go on is not entirely clear. We know that there are chromatin features that are involved, transcription factor networks and so forth. Um, but, and we think this phenomenon that we've discovered in terms of the chromatin, overall chromatin loosening is just, just a first step that enables subsequent events to happen. Mm. Right, so, so that initial event opens up chromatin and in some proportion of the cells, a small proportion of the cells, other things come into play. Actually, the surprising thing is all the cells in the plate get this. All the cells that get the, the Sendai virus and express these um, transcription factors, mm. the Amanaka factors, undergo this dramatic chromatin loosening and then when the expression of those factors abates after be between four and seven days, the chromatin goes back in the cells that do not continue. And the cells that happen to have begun activating the endogenous network for these factors uh, continue on. So we think it's the actual transcription factors themselves that are physically, as they scan chromatin by virtue of uh, their nucleosome binding capacity, because we've shown that OXOX and KLF act as pioneer factors, able to bind nucleosomal mm -hmm. DNA, that that non-specifically disrupts the chromatin and uh, enables other things to happen. Right. Uh, so those are the, uh, the, the those enable the the scanning. But are, so are all the factors necessary? I mean, uh, could it simply be that the cells that are going to be pluripotent start dividing and they get now in a state where they just, they're now different from the ones that haven't reached that, that stage? Yeah, they, I think they become different by virtue of what genetic networks get in, activated in those cells. Again, the, the exact details of what, what makes those cells continue on that particular path, uh, other than the activation of the endogenous pluripotency factors, uh, isn't entirely clear. Mm -hmm but we do know that the cells that activate the endogenous factors uh, move forward. And getting back to a point that you made about this stochastic aspect, there is a stochastic aspect, and it's possible that there's some 
randomness with which um, chromatin events allow uh, these genes to get turned on in some cells and not others. And uh, I mean, we heard talks from Conrad Hockenlinger today about uh, a, a histone methylation that profoundly, profoundly affects this process. And so that's an example of um, a chromatin state that could be involved as well. Mm. So what are, the, what are your next steps? What, what, are the, what are the experiments that you, you, you dream of doing? Right. Well, uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is ask whether in other cell fate changes that you can induce with transcription mm -hmm. factors, is some of this happening as well, based on uh, the pioneer factors for other cell fate changes, non-specifically loosen up the chromatin and prime events by uh, doing that. The other is in normal mouse development, uh, do these, does this dynamic change, is that involved in how the uh, pluripotent cells in the blastocyst get specified and so forth? And so we're trying to knock into the mouse germline a halo tag to, or halo tags to allow us to address that question in natural development and then natural cell fate changes mm. in the animal. I, I was just thinking then about uh, cell reactivation in, in this sort of sense, and I used to work on muscle. Of course, there are the satellite cells in muscle that remain right. completely dormant until there's injury and they start growing again. Mm -hmm. So that might be a sort of an example where there is not global activation, but where such activation is important. Yes, I mean, you know, if we make the mice, we can look at diverse cell fate changes for whether there's a burst of, of chromatin loosening that precedes or is coincident with a cell fate change in many developmental contexts. So, you know, right now it's sort of an early observation um, and we need to do more work to figure it out. Well, great stuff. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Jan.